Hey everyone, you're watching a little bit more live coding with Jeff. Um, as you recall, last week we um, left off with uh, <clears throat> our Vector 3 class that we were working on. We had sort of built up the major elements in here. Um, length and length squared functions, normalizing, negating most of these math operations, um, setting, most of the stuff that you're familiar with. Um, and this week I kind of want to dive into what all this stuff is and does. I don't know if I can cover it in as much detail as perhaps it deserves. Um, and honestly, operator overloading is in some ways more complicated than I can even really follow. So um, I'll try and get you the important parts here. Um, we're also going to expand out our tests in main.cpp that we wrote to do a little bit more stuff and show a little bit more about uh, what's going on in here. Um, we want to make sure that we find ways to sort of exercise all of these functions. Um, I have most of this stuff already written and I'm going to be going over kind of code that I've already put in place. So this is going to be a little bit more like uh, a cooking show where I pull a lot of stuff out of the oven and go like, hey, it's done. Magic. Uh, but uh, that's okay. We'll, we'll get to see a lot of interesting things here. And lastly, we're going to spend a little bit of time again on this idea of the physics world versus the render world. Uh, I want to show you what it looks like to use a matrix to convert a vector from some physics coordinate to a render location on screen um, to get it into like the pixel coordinates that you need to s something to show up at. Um, so that's kind of the final goal of all of this. <clears throat> so why don't we take a look at this mess of stuff here first of all so these operator overloads there is um a lot of words there um and so what you need to understand about how operator overload um functions work is that first and foremost they always take the form operator like their function name always takes the form operator space and then the character that the operator is actually represented as now sometimes there's some ambiguity like for example in the case of minus like when you use minus in the code there's two ways that you can use minus you can use minus to mean like i have the variable a and it's an integer and minus a is therefore the negation of a so it is it is the same thing as a but made negative instead and there is the other version of minus which is uh between two things so that you might have a minus b is equal to some other thing so how do we have the compiler tell the difference between these things how do i know which one i am overloading and it comes down to this subject of function signatures again so you'll notice that between this minus and this minus there is a major difference here ignoring what most of these things mean for now the only thing that's different between these two statements is that in the first one this is a parameterless function. It does not take any function parameters or any function arguments. And this one, the other negative, takes a vector3 reference. And it's passed in as RHS. Well, why would we call it RHS? That is often used in operator overloading to refer to the right-hand side because, after all, we are trying to in this case make something where we are using this minus like left hand side minus right hand side and so basically what's happening here is that when you use this minus it is implicitly understood that this is the left hand side the minus is in the middle and the right hand side is the other vector that we are subtracting here now note that this is a vector also <coughs> pardon me if you note that this is a vector 
what I'm saying here is that <clears throat> if I use minus after a vector like this and before some other vector, that this is a valid operation. If this right-hand side is a float, I can't do this because this type doesn't check out. So, I mean, realize that what we're doing here, writing it like this, is a little bit like the compiler sugaring up me doing something that looks like this, right? Where I've got left-hand side dot my function name and then parentheses to call the function and passing right hand side in. That's kind of what it's doing. This isn't really valid syntax. I don't think this would actually work, but um, that's effectively what operator overloading is. It just kind of gives you a little bit of a cheaty way to, to call functions in a way that looks more mathematical. And that's kind of what we want it for. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Without further ado, let me open up the two of these things. Oh, how about that? Look at that. What have I done? Um, so I have written these operator overloads in place. Uh, they don't have to be. Um, and my reasoning for this is that I wrote the matrix and the vector classes to be kind of as high performance as possible. And often what that means is using the inline keyword. What this does is it ensures that the code that runs in this function is always placed directly into the calling function code. Uh, this saves the program at runtime having to look up where the function is in memory to run it, um, which doesn't sound like it's very costly, but can sometimes suck up a couple hundred operations on the CPU waiting for the memory to be made available. Um, so this is sort of trading off like it makes your executable at the end of the day larger, but it also sort of improves the speed at which it executes. And that's sort of a trade off. But I mean, honestly, people care so little about how big um, any file is on a computer anymore um, that this is not usually too much of an issue. Not saying that you should use it for everything forever, but um, it's not as big of a, a problem as it once was. Or, or, you know, if you're running on reasonably powerful computers, it's not really that much of an issue. <coughs> so, anyway, um, when you write using the inline keyword, it also forces you to put your code in the .h file for this function. So that's why this doesn't show up in the CPP. Um, now there's potentially some advantages and disadvantages to that, but um, it'll, it'll work for what we're doing. So inline can be used uh, here to sort of make a performance improvement. And I could show you applying in line to some of these functions above in a moment. But so just sort of diving into what this thing does. So the first minus, so this is the one that does negation, right? Well, neat. I had made a negate function already. Um, it's named. Um, so basically that does the same thing as putting a minus sign in front of something, right? Um, because when we had looked at negate, of course, it just puts a minus sign before each one of the uh, of the members x, y, and z, so it reverses it. Okay, cool. So then minus is just doing that, and all it needs to do is return a vector three. Why is there a const in front of this? Well. I think that you may need to take this particular one on faith. Does it return a constant vector 3? Yes, it does. Is that a problem? No, not really. Um, you'll have to go to Scott and ask him why operator overloads need to return an R value. Ask him that exact phrase. <laughs> anyway. And lastly, of course, this const at the end means that this operator overload does not change this 
Vector3 at all. It only returns an entirely new Vector3 for negate. And then, of course, looking at our other minus, well, okay, so this one takes in a parameter of a constant Vector3 point, or uh, reference RHS. Now, when const is used in this way, if you remember, this means that we promise not to change RHS at all, so that's an easy enough promise to keep. <clears throat> all we need to do is call subtract, which we already wrote in exactly the same way, and pass in RHS to tell it subtract from this the right hand side of the equation and return the result of this computation. And if we go look to subtract, which we've already written over here, <coughs> right, so we had done this funky thing where we tied it into add, so we're just negating this vector here and adding it, it's the same thing. And so we're just taking its x, y, and z and adding those on. So, and then we're returning a new vector three. So there you go. And look, add, what a surprise. It's just using the add method. Multiply, you wanna bet what it's doing? Sure enough. Divide, sure enough. Like, so I made many of these functions originally because I find it's much easier to think about how the operations are working when you make standard um, standard functions like this that are just named and used in the normal way. Because when you get around to dressing up your vector to make it useful in like cool ways so that you can do math with it like more fluidly using operator overloads, those operator overloads tie so directly into what your what your functions already do so that you basically don't have to write any more code you just tie right into the stuff that you're already using and then again that sort of comes right back to that same idea that we're reusing code like all over the place right like we're always trying to find a good way to, to tie things into code that's already written so that we can avoid um, having to change too many things in too many places um, and generally keep our work a little bit smaller. <clears throat> I'm going to show you another benefit to this when we get around to testing in a moment too. So then of course we have another group of operator overloads that are a little bit less immediately important but are pretty helpful um these are some of the ones that were shown off when we were talking about vector 2 at first and the whole thing probably caused everybody's mind to reel uh at what the hell it was that we were trying to do so if i close up these ones above just so that uh you know they're sort of out of the picture for the time being uh we can sort of focus on um, what's a little bit different here? Oh, oh, oh. Actually, before we do that, I want to point something out. I had talked briefly about multiply and divide. You'll note that multiply and divide are a little bit that different than add and subtract, of course, that they take a different parameter. And if you'll recall, um, when I was talking about, like, left-hand side, so... So we've got left hand side, which is this one. Oh, let's uh, let's put that in a comment. Times so right hand side because so this is what I'd be writing, right? Because we're talking about this object is the left hand side. Let me get rid of that. That looks like I'm multiplying something as well. So if this this object is on the left hand side, so LFS is some vector and I'm using the multiplication symbol, and then this is the right-hand side. Okay, cool, that's fine. So this one, in this case, the right-hand side is a float, and the left-hand side is my vector, and I want to multiply my vector by some float. But what happens when I get something like this? Let's just say float a 5.0 um, a times a times some vector. Well, now, 
a is the left hand side and vector is the right hand side is that what I'm seeing? That's what it looks like. That doesn't look like it would be very uncommon of a situation to come across at all, does it? So here is the trick. This operator overload only overloads the, the star, the asterisk for um, multiplication when it is to the right of a vector. To do the one to the left of a vector you need to do something freaky. So this const here, or pardon me, this, this friend here is a different operator overload. So you'll notice that this one takes two arguments and it says a float on the left hand side and a vector three pointer on the or a reference on the right hand side and we're in this case we're doing the same thing we're saying go to the right hand side vector call its multiply and pass the scalar on the left hand side in but I'm not going to go into detail about what friend really is here but what's actually happening here is in the comment really what we're doing is we're overloading float to have a, an asterisk for multiplication that now is compatible with multiplying vector threes. That's kind of what's going on here. How exactly friend causes this, I'm not going to try and dig into that. You're really going to have to go to Scott on that one because uh, that's too much for now. Um, but that's how it's done. So this is how we multiply using uh, a vector or a vector that's on the right hand side and a float that's on the left so <clears throat> now um so i have these plus equals things so probably there's two major or not even really so like add and subtract so actually let's compare to the original add because we got plus equals here. So this is add and assign, and this is just add. Um, so what are, what are the big differences here? Well, in the case here, we can notice in our function signature for add and assign that we are returning a reference to a vector three and not just the whole vector three. Um, so what does that mean? Um, basically what's happening here is that, so add and assign, is meaning like take the value my current value like the value of my vector as it is right now add some other vector to it um, and assign it back to this same variable but this vector 3 reference that's being returned is and when you're done return me return my value back to some caller so you'll notice that plus just simply takes the right hand side so it takes the value of me this left hand side adds it to the right hand side and we return something new we never change the value of this vector at all at any point because we don't set anything <clears throat> add simply returns a new vector entirely now add and assign does things a little bit differently it does the very same thing that the one above does. It takes the right hand side and adds it to the left hand side, but in this case it sets this thing to it. So it assigns the added values to this vector and then it returns itself. Why would you do that? That seems super weird, doesn't it? Well, there are some kind of funky syntaxes that you can show. Um, you've probably seen something like this in the past plenty. Um, <clears throat> but did you know that you could write something that looks like this? So, 
sure enough, this statement is meaning take the existing value of a, add 5 to it, and so after that, a will be 5 greater than whatever it was, but that value can then be used ongoing in here to see if the new value of a after the incrementation is equal to greater than 6. So technically supporting a very weird syntax there, but it's, um, it could be useful from time to time. So lastly, um, just sort of expanding out from here, so minus equals is doing the very same thing with subtract, and times equals is doing the same thing with multiply, and divide equals is doing the same thing with divide by. Um, so you're saying, well, where's the friend for times equals? Well, it works out that there's really only one way that times equals works, right? Because you can really only have, um, you know, you can really only have one direction for this because we're always assigning to the left. Like, if you are assigning to something, then it must be on the left-hand side of the equation because that's how programming works. So, or at least that's how C++ works. So that, we don't have to have the, the alternate for that. And then we've got divide equals doing the very same thing. Um, there may be somebody out there who's asking, well, why didn't you overload the opposite for divide? Um, because for divide, we only have divide on the right-hand side, not the one for the left-hand side, but we do for multiplication, so what gives? Um, well, multiplication's a little bit finicky, um, because in multiplication, I mean, both of the products go together to multi multiply together to make the final result, but, is in, but in division, the two things are treated differently. One is on the top of the equation and the other is on the bottom, right? We have something where you've got a divided by five. But five divided by a is not the same thing as a divided by five, right? Those are kind of different from one another. And in fact, um, we could capture that in functions if we wanted to get that. But the, the scalar five divided by a doesn't mean like a vector a, a scalar divided by a vector, doesn't really mean much at all. And if you wanted a vector divided by a vector, that doesn't really make sense. Like neither of those things are real mathematical operations, so that's the reason that that division doesn't exist. <clears throat> so that is it. That's the, the mystery of of operator overloads and I hope that that makes a little bit more sense to you yeah you have to follow some weird rules around around syntax and whatever um, but it's not super complicated necessarily it's mostly getting these function signatures to look the way that you think that they need to uh, to get what you're going for and if you have other functions that you're already using for this stuff you can really tie this stuff in without too much difficulty it's actually not as hard as it looks um, so we've got all these things that were added in here, and I have one other little addition to this Vector3 class that I have thrown in for the sake of some um, ease of use, uh, much like the operator overloads, which I find really handy, and I'm going to throw them in right at the top here. So I'm using um, define statements. This is a um, pre-compiler statement. Um, these macros, the macro system as it's often called, uh, is used to be able to sort of insert, like all that's happening here is that I'm giving this name as an alias to this block of text. Don't think of this exactly as code. What it is, is saying to the compiler, is before you go through and compile the application, look up any usage of the text vector3 underscore back in the code and replace it with this string so that this vector goes into the code wherever I use this and then we'll compile with this vector3 in place. So it's a little bit of a last minute switcheroo on the compiler but what this lets me do is have like convenient keywords here to save me from having to type this out which I know when I type that out on the keyboard is kind of awkward because I gotta hit shift for all those dots and you know you've got commas and 
you know, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, like, not that it's really a horrifying thing to type, but it's a lot more complicated to type than just to, like, type in VEC and have this drop down from IntelliSense to pick, and boom, there I go, I've got it. <clears throat> so really all I'm doing is sort of defining my cardinal directions here, uh, where I'm saying what up and down are, what back and forward are, what left and right are, and then lastly I have a vector 3.0, which is basically the same thing as just calling a, like creating a brand new vector 3 um, without passing any, any arguments in. I could just give it, you know, like this is the same thing as this, really. Um, but, so I want a good way to be able to produce a plain vector 3 without any changes to it in such a way that when I read the code I can look at this and go okay he's making a vector 3 that has no length it's just 0 that's all I'm going for so I'm gonna show you um, now that we have all these things in place um, I can jump over to my main.cpp here and um, we can take a look at some of the work that I've done over on this side. I'm going to look at these matrix tests in a moment, um, but so we had added a number together here, and that was kind of all we did. Um, so actually, you know what, I'm going to comment this stuff out just for a moment um, so that we can sort of focus on what we did, what we can test with this vector. Um, KC. All right. <clears throat> and I'm going to knock off this line for now. Okay, so for those of you who are wondering, um, this stuff, this is really just me printing out a header. That's it. Just to inform me of what this is testing. That's about it. So here I have written a series of things that I can check up on to see that my math for all of the things that Vector3 is doing, um, check out, and that the math appears to work the way that it's supposed to. That's what I'm going for here. So, um, now, what I've done, some of these tests are very simple. In this case, so I'm just creating one Vector3 V that I've been kind of using all throughout here. First of all, I assign it to Vector3.0, check to see. What is vector 3.0? Set it to up, what does up look like? Set it to down, what does down look like? Right, what does right look like? And so on. So if I run this, <coughs> it's probably more useful to sort of keep it open. So I'm just opening it up, scroll up. So this is this header that I printed out just so that it shows me that. And then I just go through these statements. Well, what does vector 3.0 look like? This is what it prints out as, right? Because I'm just using two string and I'm Printing that out, spacing it out. Okay, up. What does up look like? Okay, positive 1 on the y-axis. Seems good. Down, negative 1 on the y-axis. Great. So I can sort of go through all these things and get, you know, get all of the values that I'm looking for here. Now, when you're doing this, you need to pay attention to the fact that, um, for example, left and right and forward and backward and up and down do have specific directions if you are in a um, right-handed rule space. Um, so realize that these are not arbitrary. They are picked in a like a particular pattern. So if you are going to do this, don't just number them or give them directions sort of however you feel like. You should probably make sure that you sort of follow the the same pattern that I'm talking about here. <clears throat> so continuing on from this, I'm like, well, okay, so let's just do a little bit of math and try some of those things. So I'm like, okay, so I'm going to make a vector 1, 1, 0. Um, so I create that and I print it out just to prove that it was set properly. Great. So it, it created and did what I was looking for. I call length squared on it to see what my length squared comes out to and I get a length squared of 2, right? Because um, this is like the checking the c squared in, in um, Pythagorean theorem. So this is like c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared and we're looking at what c squared is. So a squared is 1, b squared is 1, 
c squared is 2. And then when I square root that to get its actual length, I get the square root of 2 as 1.14421. Um, and square root of 2 makes perfect sense for that. So then I'm going to run this normalize operation. Now realize that I am assigning v to the result of this normalize because normalize doesn't actually change the length of the vector. It returns a new one with a new length. So when I normalize, I get um, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2 for this. Um, those of you who have a good eye will realize that this comes out to a length of 1. And of course, the math bears that out. Uh, the length squared is 1, because of course 1 squared is 1, um, and the actual length is 1 as well. So this is what most of my testing sort of consists of here, so I'm just going down through. Now this is the point where I start hitting math operations. I test, does adding work? Yes. Does add and assign work? Yes. Does negation work? Does subtraction work? Does subtract and assign work does multiply work does or like does multiply on the right hand side uh, with a float on the right hand side work does it work with a float on the left hand side does multiply and assign work does division work does divide and assign work i'm just going through like one after the next and covering through all those things and you'll notice that i'm not ever actually directly testing the functions add divide multiply subtract negate because we wrote this in such a way that we know all those things are sort of implicitly being tested by these. Now, ideally, your tests should cover these directly anyway, but it, you know, if you're just trying to put together something cheap and dirty, this is definitely helpful. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, um, so then I've got a couple of things down below, sort of testing um, whether um, dot and cross products are working correctly, uh, but those aren't things that are really important to what we're doing, so I'm not going to focus in on that. Um, some of you may wonder why I'm testing cross product over and over and over again. Um, really what I'm doing here is like cross product, if I'm doing the math correctly, should at some point result in the same value over again so I'm just calling cross product over and over and over until I get the same value back and that's a pretty good confidence to me that that it's working correctly because at some point it did do that um, yeah so this is this is uh, this is basically all you need to do for a test of this kind so now at this point I'm going to um, expand open that next group above us, um, this chunk of stuff, for the matrix 4x4 four four tests. So this is where I want to show you a little bit about what the matrix 4 operations are and do. So I've got this running again, um, and I'm going to scroll right up. So now you'll see that matrix 4 also has its own nice two string so that we can see what the matrix looks like and this is super helpful for this sort of situation where you're doing a test like this um, so here I'm checking I have a matrix 4 static function uh, here I should go look this up so now static functions in C++ are called by saying the type name scope resolution operator and the function name so that's what's happening here so I'm using matrix for identity and so this is giving me a single diagonal matrix where all of the like all the diagonal terms are one right and so this is what it looks like in the code so I'm not doing anything weird here I'm not formatting things weird I'm saying matrix for get me an identity matrix and that's what it does now, so I have another function that I can use, so matrix for scale, and I can pass it the x, y, and z scale factors, and it will put them into place. So 
this gives me a brand new scaling matrix. So scale, you sort of pass it the scaling factors that you need and it will give you a scaling matrix. There's actually a version of this where you can just say scale two and it will automatically put it into all three of them as well. Um, so for translation, um, those things are getting inserted in and surely enough your translation terms show up um, in the matrix. Now we get into some of the weirder ones that we're going to encounter. So matrix four orthographic, what the hell is that about? Um, so matrix three orthographic is designed to produce what is known as <clears throat> a view matrix um, that is representative of the volume that the camera is supposed to render and sort of how it um like how it uh projects this well yeah so view and project projection matrices are always tied together in sort of weird ways but um for example when you aim a camera at something there is what is called sort of a frustum um that comes out of that camera um from the point of its lens looking out into the world through some angle right um now it's kind of like a pyramid that has its tip right at the lens of the camera and sort of going outward with its bottom facing toward the world toward the direction that you're pointing that's normally how we think of how cameras work but there's another way that we can think of how cameras work Orthographic cameras are like basically putting a cube around something that we want to render and just um, rendering it with no perspective at all. It renders an exactly like rectangular prismic volume. Um, and it's really great for isometric and 2D sort of situations. Uh, you can use perspective cameras for 3D or for like sort of that 2D games with the sensation of depth, like in the plat in like platformers um, that you'll sometimes encounter. Newer platformers will do this, um, but we're going to use an orthographic camera because it really kind of makes our lives easier, and because it takes really easy inputs. Um, I'm going to jump to it here. So it takes six numbers, which seems like a lot, but um, all we need to know is like the minimum x value in the physics world that we're interested in rendering and the maximum x value minimum y value maximum y value minimum z maximum z now the z values have defaults of oh that should be negative one and one actually my bad um so basically the idea is that if z is zero it will fall between negative one and one z and it will get rendered that's really all that's going on and then we can sort of set up the bounds of coordinates in our physics world that we want to see rendered so in this case we're saying between 0 and 10 on the X 0 and 10 on the Y 0 and 10 on the Z and when this thing runs it gives you back a matrix that looks like this is it super important to know precisely how this thing is working on the inside maybe not yet um, it is a good idea to sort of check this over and maybe talk to your math prof about how um, how transformation works um, for this kind of thing. Uh, of course, Matrix 4's code is available to you and you can open it up and look at what it is actually doing inside here if you're interested to know. Um, but um, basically what happens here is that this sort of renormalizes this space to be between the values 0 and 1 instead of between 0 and 10. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to go into for the sake of this discussion. And then after this, there is one more function that I want to describe to you, which is a very weird one that is very, very powerful. It is this viewport NDC function. This is a little bit of magic, and Scott can probably explain this to you in more detail because, in fact, I'm actually using his algorithm for this. Um, so this does some complicated stuff inside, but the intention of viewport NDC, NDC stands for non, I, I believe, like non-device coordinates, or no, no, it's normalized device com, uh, coordinates. So what this is trying to do is to get you into the render world. By using this transformation, this will take your, um, your physics world 
positions and it will transform them into the coordinate space of actually reminds me let's open our little image here yay so basically this one is responsible for going from your physics world coordinates where you've got positive y going up and that your units are in meters to these coordinates where you're on the window and your units are in pixels and positive y is downward that's that's really what's sort of going on here um, so this viewport NDC um, it takes in the pixel size of the space that you want to render into and it gives you a matrix to be able to do that conversion um, for the sake of time, because I'm already at about 40 minutes, I'm not going to dig into much of what these other multiplication operations do, or these other math operations, but for the sake of just going through very quickly, I've got a matrix times a scalar, scalar times a matrix, same friend trick that I was using in vectors, um, yeah, matrix uh, multiply and assign with a scalar, matrix divided by a scalar, divide and assign by a scalar, um, and setting, and um, yeah, just sort of, you know, producing scale matrices and multiplying those. Um, so just checking to see that you can multiply one matrix by another matrix, that's an important thing. And um, yeah, so there's a few more tests in there. It's not super important that we know exactly what all those things are, Mostly, the big thing that we need to move on to is looking at the big test of transforming one, uh, transforming a vector three in physics space into render space. So the last thing I'm going to do here is um, I'm going to grab. A couple chunks of code so forgive me for copying things in but there's just too much stuff to type today for me to really want to do this so I'm gonna go through a few lines here um, yeah so all right you'll notice if you're sort of a quick reader you'll see that I'm creating a matrix called M and I'm calling it identity and I'm creating another matrix called V and I'm filling it with this orthographic I've got another matrix called P and I'm filling it with this viewport NDC result and at the end I have a matrix called MVP and I'm multiplying these three things together now this MVP matrix this is exactly what I was talking about when I'm gonna open this up again when we were talking about this these three matrices come together to produce what is called the MVP matrix and let you render something in your world into wherever you kind of want to put it. Um, now, so these, this is what's responsible for being able to get it to screen coordinates for you. That's, that's ultimately what this is all about. And in order to do this, we need a few different things. The identity is, this, this M matrix has kind of a lot to do with where the camera is positioned, kind of. But it's easier to think of, um, think of it as um, how have we moved the world to make sure that the, there is a region at the origin. Um, no, no, don't worry. Don't think about it as that. Think about it as the camera position. We'll, we'll figure that other one out another time. Um, now, this call to orthographic here is saying I want to render everything between 0 and 16 meters on the x-axis, everything between 0 and 9 meters on the y-axis, and from negative, x, or negative z to, or negative 1z to positive 1z. So I'm going to have everything at 0z because um, we're not using the third dimension for anything and so basically all this means is look at a region 16 meters wide by 9 meters tall and lastly I'm saying viewport NDC 1920 by 1200 so this is as though I were going to render my scene onto a window 
that had 1920 by 1200 resolution so presumably this would be a win like a window that's full screened on like a full hd uh monitor so um basically i'm saying stretch that region to fit a 1920 by 1200 pixel display now with each of these matrices independently <clears throat> They don't really mean that much, but when you multiply them together in this order, um, and order matters, um, you get an MVP matrix. And the MVP matrix is powerful because you can multiply vectors by the MVP matrix and produce new vectors that have been translated into pixel coordinate positions directly from whatever your physics values were. So let's say that we want to put together a little test here because so far this doesn't really test anything this sets up a few things so i'm going to define a vector three that's called physics position so i've got some object that's in the world at 12 meters on the x by six meters on the y so that's six meters up in our world um and so that's how i want to think about that now if i just run this um um okay yeah sure so it's printing out the m which is an identity matrix right all ones on the diagonals printing out v which is giving us our orthographic printing out p which is giving us this matrix from viewport ndc the total mvp matrix is this weird thing but we don't really have to understand what its numbers are we mostly just need to know sort of how it was put together and then lastly i have my physics position that i uh that I set up here. So I've got 12 meters X, 6 meters Y. No surprises, right? So let's, um, let's do something with it. What does it look like to actually use this MVP matrix? Well, uh, yeah, it's about as, about as straightforward as you'd really imagine. Um, the important thing about this is that the MVP matrix has to be on the left side of the equation for this to work. But what I'm doing is that I'm creating a vector three called render position, and it's equal to the MVP matrix on the left side times physics position on the right. Um, the reason that it doesn't work in the opposite direction is because that mathematical operation doesn't make any sense. Um, there is directionality to matrix operations, as I'm sure that you are learning in math class. So be aware that the MVP matrix has to come on the left hand side of this equation. Now, so let's reason this out so i have a comment here so i'm expecting 1440 and 400 pixels why from the top left well okay so let's reason this through um so this example is a little bit different here but um okay so let's let's sort of imagine because interestingly this mvp matrix is set up to be the very same one because i uh, wrote it from here so we have coordinates that are what does it say 12 and 6 so we're 12 meters on the x axis 6 meters on the y now if you realize we made it so that the screen goes from 0 to 16 on one side or the other which sort of means that in physics coordinates the left side is 0 and the right side is 16 and we had it go from 0 to 9 on the y-axis so the top side here is 9 and the bottom side is 0 right now so our coordinates for the screen go in reverse so in physics they go 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 or pardon me they go 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 going upward along this path but in the y-axis of render coordinates 9 is equal to 0 pixels and um, 1200 pixels is equal to um, zero meters in the opposite direction. So if we are at 12, 6, then 12 is three quarters of 16. So we should probably be about three quarters of the way along on the x axis. And you will find that three quarters of 1920 is in fact 1440. So that's why I was guessing 1440. And on the y-axis, I'm at 6, 6 out of 9, right? So that's 2 thirds of 9. And what's 2 thirds of 1,200 is 800. Well, hmm, let me think. Oh, no, that's right. Um, 
yeah, if I'm at six, then I should be basically a third of the way down the screen. Right, yeah, so, right, I'm a third of the way down the screen, so it's more like um, 1,200 minus 800, so I get 400. So I should be somewhere around here. If I had to guess, I would say I would be somewhere in sort of the the top right quadrant of the screen. Now, I don't have anything rendering this just yet, so, you know, take that with a grain of salt, I suppose, but... Um, so, my render position does indeed come out to sort of what I was expecting. Um, and I'm just going to throw in one more test here that I had in here. So, if I use the value of 4, 3, so... 4 should be one quarter of the way along the screen, so it should be somewhere like, you know, toward the left-hand side of the screen, and 3, so this should be toward the bottom of the screen, because 0 is at the bottom and, like, physics positive is going upward, um, so this should be sort of in the bottom left coordinate of the screen, um, coming up at 480, 800 or so. And, sure enough, that transformation works correctly. Or at least it seems to. Um, so, what we'll be working on, um, sort of continuing on in future videos, is going to be figuring out how to create an SDL scene using these transformations from physics to render coordinates to actually start rendering stuff out making a game loop that has like our physics classes tied in to be able to do cool physics stuff so that we can sort of build on that and actually start making some things that resemble games that's the big goal from here on out i know it's been a like a long haul looking at a lot of text and not really a whole lot that's super interesting um but it's going to come together uh once we start talking gravity and putting together our gravity simulations um which you're going to see a little bit of for assignment three. So um, look forward to that. I know I am. I'm actually pretty excited about um, being able to get into a rendered space and, uh, you know, do some, some cool stuff with SDL. Uh, so anyway, um, I'll see you there. See you next week.